Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, tonight's edition of PNP Live. We are so delighted to have all of you with us. What an amazing crowd already forming. Um, I'm Lisa Muscatine. I'm a co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my husband and co-owner, Brad Graham. And on behalf of our uh, wonderful and talented staff, we welcome you all to tonight's event, which we are so excited about. It's going to be great. Um, it's such a delight to host Anique Lafarge for a discussion of her new book, it's called Chasing Chopin, a musical journey across three centuries, four countries, and half a dozen revolutions. And today is the actual publication date of the book, so we feel even more special uh, and honored to be a part of Anique's uh, launch for this, this wonderful book. I just want to call your attention to a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question for Anique um, or for Michael, you can ask it in that by clicking on that icon, and you can type in your questionnaire. That's going to be the, the easiest way for us to get the questions uh, to our guests. Um, I also want to point out that in the chat column on the right of your screen, you will find a link to purchase the book. Uh, and lucky all of you, Anique will sign these beautiful, lovely book plates to go into the book if you would like uh, a signed book plate. Um, it's kind of a special treat and they're quite uh, lovely. So uh, take advantage of that. Uh, you know, buy the book for yourself, your neighbors, your friends, your relatives, your coworkers for holiday gifts. Um, you can't go wrong. And um, what a lovely thing to have the book plate as well. Um, the other thing I would just want to mention is that uh, Anique has produced an incredible companion website for the book that really takes you through chapter by chapter with relevant links to uh, accompanying pieces, pieces that she talks about. Uh, influential pieces and other things that really enrich the reading of the book. And it's a very easy website to remember. It's called whychopin.com. You'll also see that in the link. And I really hope you'll take advantage of it. Uh, it really is a, a fun way to read, read the book. Um, let me just say that I fell in love with this book from the moment I began reading an advanced copy several months ago. And I should make clear that like many, many people, I enjoy classical music, but I am far from an expert. I recognize Chopin's most famous pieces, but again, I knew relatively little about the composer himself. And I would say my piano playing stopped at roughly age 10. So reading Anik's book was a kind of a joyful awakening for me. It was a chance to accompany her on this wonderful musical and cultural journey. Um, and in the book, uh, when you read it, you'll see she weaves together her personal experiences as an amateur pianist. Uh, she offers a fresh take on Chopin, the man and composer. Uh, she educates her readers about the evolution of the piano itself, which is fascinating. And she lends a modern day appreciation of Chopin's music in shaping history and culture over, as she says in the title, the past few centuries. Um, I think many of you know Anique is an editor. She's the author of an award-winning book about the High Line in New York City. She's a photographer and a cultural critic. Um, and reading this book, I realized that only someone of such breadth of interests could take on a project as ambitious as chasing Chopin and make it seem so effortless. Um, lest you do not trust my judgment alone, uh, concert pianist Jeremy Dank in a review posted literally just a few hours ago in the New York Times calls Chasing Chopin a charming and loving new book. And he says, it took me into many unexpected corners. I couldn't agree more with that uh, description. It is such a gem of a book and we are so happy to be part of the launch, as I said uh, earlier. We are also uh, very happy to have with us and honored to have with us Michael Kimmelman um, tonight. He'll be in conversation with Anique. Uh, Michael, I'm sure many of you know, is the architecture critic for the New York Times, where he's innovated a new way of talking about the built space, particularly in cities. At the Times, he's also served as a, as a foreign correspondent covering Europe and the Middle East, um, as the paper's art critic, and twice he's been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. What many may not know is that Michael's also an acclaimed and deeply talented pianist, and he performs regularly in New York City. Currently, he's working on a book that we are also very much looking forward to and very excited about. Um, it's about the rebuilding of Notre Dame Cathedral. It will be published by Penguin Press. Um, Anika and Michael, we are so happy to have you. It's gonna be a great evening. Thank you so much for uh, being with us at PNP and uh, the floor is yours. Gosh, thank you. Thanks, Such an uh, honor to be here. Uh, and hi, Nick. Hi, Michael. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Very well. So um, let's 
let's plunge in. Um, and let me ask you, first of all, why did you focus on, the book is built really around the um, so-called funeral march sonata of Chopin. So um, that was obviously the seed for the book. So maybe you could just describe how that seed was planted and why that particular piece sort of captured your imagination. Yeah, well, as you know, um, I, the first time that I heard the sonata was when you played it at the Polish consulate. and It was in the late 1990s. Um, and when you got to the funeral march in this, the Opus 35 sonata, it's the third movement, I thought, ah, so this is where this comes from. And so I listened in that way that you do when you think you know something um, because it's that familiar, because of course, this is a piece that everybody knows as part of the popular culture. Um, but then you brought that, that dirge, that famous dirge to an end and start playing this gorgeous nocturne like song that completely undercuts the message of death and loss that you've just heard because it's optimistic, it's hopeful, it's joyful. And then that part finishes on this really lovely cadence and the funeral march comes back and it undercuts again that mood that we've been placed in. So this piece really has um, a surprise in it. And um, if you're not familiar with it, it's, if you are, if you've, you know, if you've gone to many concerts before, you know the piece, it's, 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 it's not a surprise. But I think um, that what Chopin was doing was really embracing the whole range of human experience here. He takes us from, from loss and death through the memory of love back to the reality of loss again. And, and I just, I found that message to be really moving. Uh, this idea that our experience of losing someone, that sadness and pain in a kind of minor key howl is, is wrapped up at the same time in this sensation of love, which is um, a force of gentleness and beauty. So it was that dichotomy, that juxtaposition that I, that I found so much power and meaning in, um, in that piece. Yeah. I mean, um, we'll talk about the whole sonata because it's, of course, the third out of four movements um, in the piece. But for, I assume most people here know what we're talking about. But of course, that piece is familiar from all sorts of uh, movies and um, cartoons. And it's sort of that, that melody of that theme of the funeral march um, itself has become a kind of cliche. It's, it's in some ways one, one of, if not Chopin's most famous tune. But I guess what you're saying is that that um, that middle section, um, which is such a contrast, was to you a surprise. That, that was the revelation, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was the re revelation that, that the funeral march wasn't just the funeral march that we know, that we all know. I mean, you know, people in my parents' generation and your parents' generation remember it as the music that accompanied in the streets, JFK's um, a coffin as it was as it was taken through the streets of Washington after he was assassinated. It is used in state funerals. It's but it's also used as you say in in cartoons. You know in the Looney, Tar Looney Tunes cartoons when somebody exactly. gets, you know killed with a gigantic axe. Yeah. So you know what what to me but but embedded in it is this other idea and I think that Chopin was really doing something very different. Um, and of course you know I write about this in the book. The real one of the real surprises. In, in researching this, this sonata was that right before he sent off one of the, the, the penultimate draft to his publisher, Chopin struck his pen through the word funèbre, or funeral, in, in, uh, funeral in French, um, you know, signaling that actually he really, it wasn't a funeral march that he had in mind, he was doing something different. So what we think of as the world's famous funeral march actually, um, as Jeffrey Kalberg, a scholar who's written a lot about it, um, questioned, you know, is it really a funeral march at all? You know, it's, yeah. It's a surprising well, piece in a lot of ways. Well, I don't want to get lost too much yet in, in musicology and going back to Beethoven's uh, Funeral March Sonata, which was obviously interesting to Chopin. But I want to talk about your obsession because it's a really interesting thing. You'd been studying the piano. You'd taken it up recently when uh, you came to my concert. Um, but this is now, you know, this led you down these paths. And we're talking about more than 20 years ago. So this is quite an interesting journey. I mean, why? Why, after all these years, um, did you sort of want to go explore Chopin in this kind of depth and in such a personal way? Because the book is, to me, what's really interesting of the, of the book right, right off the bat is it's not a straight up biography and it's certainly not a straight up work of musicology. It has a quality that's rather like Chopin. It's a series of, um, wow fragments and and uh, chapters linked together that are deeply personal and that sort of come together, they're woven 
in a way that you, you kind of have to, like a suite, uh, a group of the preludes, a suite of mazurkas or something. So you, you chose to sort of pursue your own, like Chopin does, these, these passions um, that took you down different roads and then weave them together. So it's a very particularly interesting project, I think, and it comes out so as such a personal book. So I have to just push you a little farther. What is, so why 20 years later did you sort of become obsessed with this and, and decide you really needed to do a book about Chopin? Well, the, the funeral march kept kind of popping up. Um, there were a couple times in 2016, which was when I started writing the book, that it did. One was when um, I went to see my mother for the last time in the hospital in Massachusetts, and she was clearly dying. And when I got on the, on the train to go home, um, I, I, the music just came to me in my head, you know, as music just does periodically, it just comes into your brain, but it wasn't the funeral march, it was the trio, it was that, it was that D flat major, mm -hmm. lovely major key nocturne like song. And then about another six months later or so, I flew to Chicago to visit a friend of mine who was dying. She was an author that I had worked with, um, Amy Krauss Rosenthal, I'm sure a lot of people who are here know her work. Um, and, you know, I went to say goodbye to her and then I took the train home because I love trains. And the train leaves at nine o'clock from Chicago to New York. And I stopped at a jazz club on the way home. And I was really sad because it was just really tough to see my friend in this, in this condition. And I'm sitting there at this table with this glass of bourbon and this j jazz trio is, you know, kind of tossing around this wonderful, uh, you know, jolly uh, song, jazz song. And Suddenly they start riffing on Chopin's funeral march and they were tossing at the pian piano, piano, tossed it to drums, tossed it to uh, the guitar. And, it, and, it, and, and what was striking to me was that they were doing it in a gesture of love and, and joy, they were smiling um, and they were playing this, this piece. And I just thought, why does this piece keep turning up? And so I got on the train and I started Googling and I, I just found that there was this really interesting story. And in fact, the thing about the, 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 the whole sonata really, but the funeral march in particular, you can unpack every aspect of the story, all the key themes in Chopin's life by looking at this one mm. work, his, his um, tragic loss of his homeland, his illness, the famous trip to Mallorca with George Sand, um, his, his innovation in the piano. Um, there's really sort of everything that he is, that's important about him is there. But for me, I found, what was really surprising was that he was just not the cliched figure that I had grown up with when I started taking piano lessons. Yeah. And so that, that really was what motivated me was I found somebody really different from the, the, the figure that I thought I knew in the cliche of the sonata that I thought I knew. You mentioned a whole bunch of the themes that you pursue in the book. And what's sort of wonderful is that you go to places, you first of all, you physically go to places. And I want to talk about some of those things too, because obviously place for you, you did you wrote a book on the High Line, place is a meaningful thing to you. And I want to talk about the relationship of place. But you also, you know, in the book, you're, you're listening um, to a Chopin competition that takes place on period instruments. You get involved with a video game based on Chopin. So you're, you're obviously looking for ways in which Chopin has inspired other people and Chopin insinuates himself into parts of um, into places and people's lives that might not be um, obvious, and especially now. And so we should also talk about why Chopin is meaningful in a broader sense. But let's let's go back to this um, this thing, this ide fix you had about um, <laughs> about <You're> barely us <laughs> <laughs> exactly about Chopin. So um, you were studying the piano as well. And I assume you did that not because you decided you wanted to suddenly change careers and become a, um, a concert pianist, but you were looking for something at the piano. So let me just ask you about that a little bit. What is it that you think that you were looking for and what are you still looking for when you're at the piano? Um, I, I heard from a good source today, you were practicing a little bit. So <laughs> you're still, you're still involved. What is it that the what is it that the piano gives you that only the piano gives you? Well, you know, I got I, I got into the piano. I was sort of talking about it. It was the mid 1990s, and I got from my partner, whom you know very well, Ann Gottoff, Um I got you know that gift that one gets, the greatest gift of one's life, which is that she gave me a really good um, electronic keyboard 
which in those years, they were just starting to come about where they had the weighted keys and they were much more piano-like than keyboard keyboards had been prior to that. Than electronic keyboards had been, electronic yeah. Electronic keyboards, yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I found a really great teacher, wonderful guy at um, what was at, at Turtle Bay Music School, which has now closed. His name is Rafael Cortez. And um, studying with him was really exciting to me because he came up through the sort of traditional conservatory European style of education. And every piece that we talked about was like um, a little history lesson. We talked about culture. He's very interested in art. Um, it really was a way of looking at um, different periods, different styles, um, and, and different voices, because of course, composers across different centuries write in different voices, and, and they're artists, and so it's, it's about studying art and sort of understanding intent. Um, for me, it was also just very personal. It, it, it was a way, I mean, a lot of people meditate. Um, for me, the, the concentration, the focus at the piano is something that just gives me enormous joy, but also calms me and allows me to focus. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, you know this as a, as a pianist yourself, there are, there are ways that when you practice really hard music, and I've always played, you know, the repertoire way above the level that I could play it easily at. Um, you know, when you're, when you're working on a difficult passage, you, you make it harder in order to make it easier. So you play rhythms or you, or you play the same passage in both hands or you, you know, you do things that are really unnatural. And then your brain somehow kind of ties it all together. And when you go back and you play it the way it's written, it's easier, it just kind of flows. Hmm. And there's something about, I mean, as if life isn't difficult enough, um, there's something about, you know, sort of making things harder to then make them reveal themselves um, hmm. and, and make them easier that I find really rich and really, um, and really great. And also just, you know, the music is really beautiful. It's really, it's really wonderful to, to play something that is moving and captures different moods and expressions and- Yeah. And the I mean, piano itself like, is such a is such an extraordinary instrument because you can do so much. With, I was reading the other day, and I think it was in Stephen Huff's wonderful book *Rough Ideas*, where he talks about how many gradations there are in the, just the sustain pedal. It's like you can just like it's thirteen or thirty-seven or something. I can't remember what the number is, but just in like you can mm -hmm. press the pedal down, just you know, in in little tiny increments, yeah. and the whole world changes. That yeah. that's I just think that's mind blowing. It's so cool. Yeah. And it changes instrument to instrument, of course. And you have this wonderful section of the book, maybe we could talk about this. So one of the things you early on um, describe is listening, uh, is making a trip um, and, and listening as well to, uh, where is it again? It's up in Massachusetts? Yeah, it's called Ashburnham, Massachusetts. It's about right. an hour out of Boston. Yeah, and they have all sorts of historical pianos. So maybe yeah. you could describe a little bit. First of all, why did you go? What were you looking for? And what, what did you gain from them, listening to them play these well, I, kinds of I games? went there, it's the Frederick Collection of Historic Pianos in this tiny little town called Ashburnham, Massachusetts. And it's run by a married couple, uh, Pat and Mike Frederick. And they have some 30 odd pianos ranging from the 1920s down to the 1790s. And I went there because I knew or early on in my research, I knew that you really can't tell the story of Chopin in any way meaningfully without understanding the difference between the pianos that were um, being used during the 19th century and also the evolution of the piano and how that changed and influenced the way people wrote music. So um, I can't remember how I found out about them, <clears throat> but I went there, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty early on in my, in my research. And it's, you know, I've been, I've been trying to think as I've been doing, having conversations about this book, what's a good analogy for um, the difference between a modern piano like a Steinway and a period piano like a Playel or an Iran, the ones that Chopin loved. And the closest I can come to it is, it's like the, um, the difference between seeing a Shakespeare play performed live at the Delacour Theater in Central Park um, and then seeing the same production on television. It's the same play, it's the same author, same characters, same words, but the means through which we're perceiving it are really, are really very different. And so it has a, a really a changed quality um, and I think actually a lot of people heard that recently when, when public radio broadcast Richard II. Um, it was with a cast that was largely made up of people of color. And I think what was exciting is that it's the same story, um, but it's, it's, it's being told in a different voice. And that's what you get with historic pianos. So when you go to the Frederick Collection, um, they, Pat and Mike, who are very talented pianists themselves, they take you through, they start in the 1920s and they go backwards in time 
through all these different pianos. And they play the pieces of music that were written in the era that that piano was built on. They, they play them on various different pianos of that era. And they make you hear the differences between the pianos from different countries. They have pianos from Germany, Austria, England, France, America. Um, and you start to understand and appreciate that in the early days of the piano, and especially in its heyday during the 19th century when Chopin was laying, countries had their own sounds. Hmm. And the people who made pianos in Vienna, for instance, didn't care what the people in Paris or London or New York thought. They cared what Viennese audiences really liked. Um, and so this also had a, a real influence on the, on the music that was being written. And so this is the, the story that they tell here. And, and when you go there, it's like being like in a United Nations of, of piano music, because you really, they make you listen, they make you listen differently. It's so rare in our world that we are able to listen in a, in a really acute way and hear things that are surprising and revelatory about, about our culture, about other cultures. And that's what happens in this place. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. I mean, you, you raised a few interesting issues there. One is, of course, um, we should talk now about Chopin and his Polishness and this idea of, um, because you pursue this a lot, I think, and it, it's a very interesting subject. But but earlier you you talked about, you know, hearing Shakespeare in different forms. I think, I, I take it that what you're not saying is that there is a correct single way in which that Chopin wrote for a particular kind of instrument and that hearing it on a modern Steinway is in some way wrong. I, I, what is it that you, what is it that you took away from these kind of, this wider, less standardized range of sounds? Well, I think what, I mean, when you, when you hear the, the, the older pianos, the older pianos, the real difference is that they, um, they project a multitude of, of tones over a, a changing dynamic range. So they go from very, very loud to incredibly soft. And what that means is that a melody that you play in the right hand can be louder than what you play in the left hand. And it can even carry a slightly different timbre um, or tonal quality. And um, you, you hear the dynamics differently, I think, in the, in the, different, um, in the different pianos. I don't think that, I mean, you know, I mean, people keep asking me, well, what, what would Chopin think about a, you know, a Steinway? And it's kind of like saying, well, what would Henry Ford think of a Toyota 4Runner? You know, it's just, it's kind of an impossible question to answer. But Chopin was a real um, early adopter. And everywhere he went, when he traveled around Europe, he went to piano factories. And he played the Alia Melodicon, and he played the organ, and he played every kind of keyboard. He was, he was so interested in, in keyboard music of every sort. So, you know, I think that the, 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 you have to play the, you have to adjust your playing in a way. Like when I, when I uh, listened and, and interviewed people who participated in the first Chopin competition on period instruments in 2018, yeah. what these young people said to me, all of them is that, you know, you, you hear different colors in his music. It changes the way you, you look at the text. Mm. Um, I, I heard things that I had never heard before. They had to adjust their technique because the mechanics are very different. Yeah, well, among um, other things, the play L keys are narrower, which means it's easier to play a lot of things than it is on a modern piano. That's right. The reaches are not as, you know, his hand wasn't as big. Yeah. So. And the action is lighter, you but, know, but, but I mean, so it was on Vladimir Horowitz's piano too, which, you know, he had adjusted so that it would be extremely easy to play. Um, but, you know, I think that it's, if you, if you, like, I've been comparing, like, for instance, the, 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 the Nocturne Opus 48, number one, this is a this really, really beautiful piece that has this very emotional, dramatic section in the middle with octaves. And I've been listening to it a lot on, on modern pianos. And I went then and listened to Yuan Shang, who is a really talented um, Chinese pianist who's recorded a lot on the, in fact, on the Frederick's 1845 Play L. And I listened to his performance of this. And you just hear a different thing. You hear different, um, it's, it's, unless you're a really, really, really great pianist, you can't play that piece because it's muddy because Chopin has all these pedal markings. And um, so you, you know- It takes and a lot of work. It's a very beautiful piece. Yeah, yeah it is playable. a very beautiful piece. <laughs> um, Stephen Huff said another really interesting thing in his, in his book about how, you know, you can, you can play, you can make lists sound good on a bad piano, but you can't, you need a really good piano to make Chopin sound good. And I think that's the sort of the larger issue that, you, yeah. that, that, that really abides there. 
the, um, I, I thought it was interesting, as I said, that you identify, you, you, you were struck by the way in which, uh, you were struck by the way in which nationalities had different kinds of pianos and things. And actually, as pianists know, the Hamburg Steinway is different than the, was right. in any case different than the, the New York Steinway. But you, you focus a lot, and we always think of Chopin as a Polish composer, and you, um, obviously this question of place to you um, is embedded somehow in Chopin's identity and embedded in the music. Um, and early on in the book, you talk about this ideas of homelessness, yearning, and redemption through music as this, um, but you're also talking about it as a kind of Polish quality at that moment. So maybe you could just unpack a little bit why that theme resonates with you and what you think it meant for Chopin. Well, I think that the, you know, a big, a, a really major part of the story of Chopin's life was his self-exile from Poland. He left in 1830 and he never returned. There was an uprising, a political uprising. There was an enormous amount of social revolution going on all over Europe in that time. And um, his music was filled, he, he, he wrote in the typical, in the, in the traditional Polish forms, the mazurkas and the polonaises and all of that. But when you read, um, you know, musicologists on what it is that makes Chopin's works so in innovative and so unusual, um, they talk about how he took these forms and transformed them using all kinds of, I mean, it, it's, it's not worth going into here. You have to read a lot of dense musicology to really understand, to answer that question, why was he so extraordinary? Why was he so innovative? Um, but, you know, people kept saying to him, um, say, saying of him that he, he composed Poland, that, um, and, and, in, and in a lot of his pieces, he would sort of smuggle in, um, like in the, the wonderful B minor scherzo, um, it's this howling, he wrote it right after he left uh, Poland and he couldn't get, he couldn't come back. He was in Vienna at the time, uh, or sorry, not, not in Vienna, in Germany. Um, and he, it, it's this really emotional, searing um, opening. And then he stops and in the middle, he plays, he, he does this riff on a sort of typical um, Christmas carol, a cradle song, a Polish cradle song. And then he goes back to the to the howl afterwards. So he his music really embedded a lot of Polish music um, and Polish forms. Um, but he was, you know, almost as French. I mean, the French kind of claim Chopin mm. to the annoyance of the of the Poles. Um, <laughs> sort of, you know, is he really French or is he Polish? Um, yeah. I mean, he he moved he he played with all these forms as well. And this is, of course, what's interesting. I mean as a great romantic, right? He was always sort of toying with the form and, and distorting it and fragmenting it and doing things which um, played against the form very often. And frankly, the Sonata, we've, we've moved away as your book does from the Sonata, um, but the Sonata was loathed in the beginning. Schumann thought it was ridiculous for unrelated nonsensical movements. Um, but I, I have to say, I mean, I think it's become one of the sort of, you know, uh, tentpole uh, sonatas of, of the piano literature, partly because Chopin was um, understanding the classical form in that case, but, but not allowing it to dictate what he did with it. Um, and, and there is this tension in his work, isn't there, that he's not, he's not, he's not just doing Polish themes and patriotism, he's doing something quite quite special to himself. Yeah. And I think one of the things that he's doing, and this was this was really the, the kind of the cosmic thing that made me really kind of fall in love with him um, when I read more about him, was that he really, um, it was a time he was pressured by everybody to write in larger forms. Um, he yeah. was, everybody said, write the great Polish opera, write symphonies, write oratorios, cantatas, whatever. And it was at a time, I mean, Chopin would kind of recognize our time, I think, because, um, in the 1830s, because you had all these, it was the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, you had printing presses, you had circulation of, people became celebrities, there were piano duels, um, concert halls were getting bigger, pianos were getting bigger, um, everything was getting bigger. And Chopin hated performing. He, he felt that you know this was not where art happened. And he didn't want to write in these large forms. And he really had the, um, he had the, the gumption and the sort of understanding of his own art to be able to walk away from that and to say, and to, and to go his own way. And he, he said at one point something like, I wanna create a world of my own. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that 
his music was, while he was alive, it was really criticized. You mentioned Schumann, there were a lot of others who, they talked about how it was very feminine or it was, you know, it was slight because it wasn't, it wasn't these big complex forms. Um, but there's an enormous amount of, of uh, simplicity in Chopin's. I mean, you and I talked about this recently about the, about the ending, the last movement, the finale of the sonata, which is like 75 bars of music and it takes 75 to 90 seconds to play. It goes by in a, in a, in a second. Um, it was really many, many years after he died in the early 1920s, I think, that musicologists started to understand how innovative he was, how brilliant he was, because he was able to you know, condense um, he favored simplicity. He didn't want to keep repeating everything over and over again. You know, sonata form was based on this idea of, of repetition and, and regurgitation. And he really, he was, he was comfortable um, going his own way and, and, and writing in the style that he felt comfortable with that enabled him to say what he needed to say. And, and I, I find that really impressive, particularly when you read about the, 19th, the, the 1830s and you see how much pressure there was. I mean, it's not that different. It's, it's like, can you imagine Lang Lang just kind of saying, you know what, forget it, I'm gonna go and I'm not gonna concertize anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk away, I'm gonna do what I no, want. No, not in his case. Doesn't happen, we don't. And, it, and, it, and it's, it, it wasn't that much different in, those, in that period. So what he did really was, I think, quite, quite extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to, so, since we talked about place a bit, I wanted to, to talk a little bit as, as relationship with George Sand and and of course you went to her um, estate and so maybe begin by telling me what surprised you about the relationship that they had and and how how what did you learn from going tracing their paths? Well, you know, Sand like Chopin comes down to us in a in a form of a cliche mm. um, that she was this cigar chomping feminist. She was enormously self-involved and self-important and long-winded and um, faithless and had tons of lovers. And all of that is in the, is in the literature. It absolutely is there. Just the way all the stuff about Chopin is in the literature, it's absolutely there. But I, I had a revelation when I went to Noah, um, her, her home in central France, um, when I went up the stairs and saw what she had done to his room. So Chopin was extremely noise sensitive and the house was very noisy. There were lots of children. There were people coming and going. There were servants. And what, what Georges Sand did is she, she innovated. She invented a system of soundproofing based on um, horsehair and fabric. She created these double doors for him. She ripped up the tiles outside his room and she laid down wooden flooring. She did everything that she could to enable him to, um, to, make, to make his space a space that he could, um, that he could work well in. And, and that kept coming up every time I, uh, everywhere I went um, in, in Georges Sand's orbit. She had this kind of, this, this, this sort of deep sense of duty and friendship um, and dedicated a huge amount of her own energies to enabling other artists to do good work. She did this with Delacroix, with Liszt. I mean, she really had, she was surrounded by, by artists. Um, and I think that's what she, she was a great enabler of Chopin. I mean, I think that there, um, that their relationship was was really complicated and very difficult, yeah. um, but they were both doing really innovative things. I mean, she she wrote books that investigated subjects like gender identity that were way ahead of their time, and and she interrogated those subjects with such enormous humanity and seriousness. Mm. Um, so I think she had a huge amount of integrity as an artist and as and and as a person too that she doesn't really get a lot of credit for. You're actually um, describing Chopin. Everything you just said could be applied to Chopin as well. I think that's right. And Sorry. their relationship was really kind of a tragedy. You know, it it, uh, it 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 was. It's very sad to read, particularly about the way that it ended. But they did some of their best work together. So yeah. you know, this is a, a story of two artists enabling each other, and, yeah. and um, it was a relationship of great consequence for that reason. You describe also at a certain point the, the um, estate. Um, at, you described the alleys of trees and also the combination of wildness. And I was sensing that you were looking in a certain sense for seeing in the physical, as you do in Mallorca, the, the physical landscape as having inspired the music or, or in, for both of them, I suppose, the writing and the music. Yeah. I, I think that's, I mean, I saw these, these contrasts and juxtapositions in the landscape that I absolutely experienced in, in his music. Um, 
the, she said, George Sen said that the, the landscape there was, was a combination of severity and grace, melancholy and magnificence. Um, I think that's the exact quote. That's exactly what it was, yeah. And you really could say that about Chopin's music. You know, it yeah. really was. And, and in Noah, her very aristocratic grandmother who, who bought the property during the terror, uh, when she left when she left Paris, she had these very formal sort of typical French alleys and gardens, and and then to, to off to one side there's this really sort of wild forest, and that was the place that little young Aurore, she was known before she became her son, loved to go, and and her story is filled with um, with these kinds of juxtapositions, and and also in in you know in the in Majorca it was this place of of just exceptional beauty and. Um, and, and sort of optimism that they thought they could do such great work there. And then it turned out to be very cold and he got very sick and, um, and the landscape kind of turned on them. All the sand writes about how all the leaves fell off the trees, um, which was kind of a metaphor. So I, yeah, somebody who, who writes about place and I, I always have a camera with me. I have a good camera and I, and, and I use photography as a way of kind of interpolating too, um, you know, and, and, and to help my memory and all of that. Um, it was it was so necessary to me to go to these places and and really um, and of course they're totally different from they were from from the way they were when yeah. when Chopin and were there, but you still yeah, but you get can, that feeling. You can still kind of imagine to to a larger degree, I think, <clears throat> what it was that attracted them to these places, what what kinds of inspiration they could get from being yeah. there. And they are today real places of pilgrimage. I mean, I describe yeah. in the chapter about Mallorca, um, the pilgrimage that a young Japanese pianist, uh, Nobuyuki Suji made, which was quite extraordinary. And he brought, a, he brought a modern Steinway piano up this hill into this old monastery to sort of pay tribute to Chopin, to try mm -hmm. to really unpack for himself what the experience was like in that room where Chopin composed. Um, it's very moving going to these places still. Yeah. The, um, I mean, what is it that you what is it that you hope people take away about Chopin or or from Chopin in this in this book? You you're not really writing to tell them how to play the piano or even how to interpret the piece, but you are expressing this very deep. Um, you're taking this journey and this very sort of um, deep relationship you gain through his music. Um, with creativity itself, there's a there's a sense that you that this journey has helped you understand the sort of the depth of Chopin's uh, creativity, but also you know so sort of the value of these pieces um, like the funeral march. Well, what is it though that you think people can take away? Maybe especially nowadays. Well, I think for me, um, his independence was really was really inspiring to me. As I said before, I mean the fact that he resisted all these pressures and um, and really. Um, you know, I think um, I, I, I found in, in his story a kind of a tonic um, to this, to our current our present culture of virtuosity and bloviation and, and expression. I mean, I think that, again, he would kind of recognize that need for fame, the social media, the, yeah. because that was all around him and everybody was doing it and everybody was saying, you know, you should do it too, because that's the way you're going to become immortal is if you write, you know, this great opera and blah, 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 blah. Um, so, you know, I think... Um, I think also, you know, in this in this present moment, um, in the middle of a pandemic, and of course, you know, there there were pandemics and epidemics raging all throughout Europe during the during the nineteenth century, and and Chopin was ill very early. I mean, by the time he was sixteen or so, he was he was presenting most of his life, yeah, most of his life. And I think he knew, and I think that 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 kind of haunts the Mallorca story. This idea that he really it was it was very his his very beloved sister had died at around 16 i think of, of tuberculosis so it was very much around and very much a, an issue for him um but i think that that you know i've been thinking about this lately in part because uh, again to 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 mention my my partner and she she mentioned the other day that um one of her colleagues um lost a very very dear um family member and we were talking about how sad that was, how how really um, how really moving that was, and 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 quoted that wonderful thing that Queen Elizabeth said after 9/11 that grief is the price we pay for love, mm. and and I think that that sentiment really runs through the funeral march. Um, it's what it's what resonated for me the first time I heard it when you played it, and and it still moves me. That 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 you know it's joy and sorrow, it's life and death, um, and we have a lot of that now. So I I think. 
you know, one artist's way of, of conjuring with that mm. is what you get when you read the story of this very kind of known but unknown work. Um, yeah. And so I, you know, I think maybe that's, that's something too. Yeah, I mean, it, you said at the beginning how that very beautiful melody that it sort of, that consoling melody of love that happens in the middle of the march balances. But in fact, one of the most interesting things about this, not a, I, I think, is that um, it is very, and I think this is why people like Schumann and others early on had trouble with it, it is that these are often unresolved um, contrasts. There are things that exist together, but don't necessarily um, make sense together. You can't quite, they don't, they don't equal a whole. There's some imbalance that's constantly in the piece and it's, it's in all of the movements. Um, so that the form is, is remains in some ways unresolved and, and a question mark. Um, yeah. and, and that's often true in, um, in Chopin's work is that I think you have, uh, you, you mentioned the last movement of that piece, which is uh, often called Wind Over the Graves or yeah. whatever. It's a very uh, technically um, tricky, um, a very quiet um, kind of murmuring, rustling um, that Wind Over the Graves is an easy thing to say, but it's actually a piece, I think Dank mentioned this rather wonderfully in his review of your book, which is great. That, that an audience is left at the end without knowing whether to applaud or not. There's something unresolved um, and left am, am, ambiguous. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the most moving things about Chopin is that he's, he doesn't provide you very often with easy solutions, though he gives you these incredibly beautiful moments, these exalted, unbelievable moments. Um, there's, there's often a fragmentary um, restless quality to the music. And I think you, you convey that in the book too. I, one question I wanted to end with though was, do, do you like Chopin? Not everybody likes Chopin and it, you never quite, he's, he's a slightly elusive figure with you. You see him through the music and through George Sand and so forth, but I couldn't tell whether you, um, I don't know if you're one of those people who left a lozenge like everybody does at his grave in Paris or whether you sort of have your own ambiguous feelings about him. You know, I, I, it's a really good question because, and a really hard question to answer because I, I think he was probably a really difficult person to be. <laughs> yes. um, and you know, you read stories about his, like I, I was so moved, now I'm gonna talk about why I love him so much, um, but <laughs> by, the, by his, his work as a teacher. Um, I mean, there are famous stories about the stormy lessons, you know, and how difficult he was, but there are also these stories about how he, um, he, he, one of his students said, I think he can read hearts. And he customized all of his teaching to the, to the, not only just the playing level of his students, but to their psychology, he, he, he understood their psychology. And he would say to them things like, you know, when you're at the piano, I give you absolute freedom to be whoever you are, play this piece. And he said this of his own piece, in fact, of, of the Opus 35 Sonata, play it like nobody ever played it before or ever will again. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, he was enormously generous as a, as a teacher. Um, I, I guess I, I, I take those things, those, those, the things that inspire me about him, his independence, his understanding of his own heart, his desire to find his own voice. Um, I think those are, th are things that we all wrestle with, that, 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 that's hard. And, and, I, and you know, for somebody who's able to kind of walk away and, and write in those, I mean, he was so criticized for, for, for the forms, for the, for the shorter forms that he wrote in. Um, but, you know, you think we, we have this like way of pressuring composers to create these enormous complicated um, uh, you know, works. It's, it's not for nothing that he's known as the poet of the piano. You look at, a, at the form like of a, of a sonnet or a villanelle, you know, you, you've got to be Elizabeth Bishop or W.H. Auden to be able to pull that off, you know, and that's what Chopin did, you know, to be able to write short is harder than anything else. And so, and he did that against all this pressure to write big. So, yeah, I, yeah I, I really do. I really do like him. I think he's, and I think he was really, you know, he was, he was an early adopter. He was interested in, in, in the technology and yet he stood outside of it. He was both in it and outside of it. And I think that was a very romantic 
I mean, romantic in the sort of the romantic generation. Yeah. I mean, you make, I, I want to open it up to questions, which I'll, I'll ask course, in a yeah. second, but I was going to say, you raise an interesting point when, when you went to that place in Massachusetts, um, the, the people who ran it, I, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting their yeah, name. Like Frederick. Right, the Fredericks, that they said to you, the story of the piano is often told through technology, um, but that it's not, that, that's, that's a very narrow way of looking at it. And actually, I think you say this, it really is a back and forth thing that the technology opened up new possibilities like repeated notes, um, but also that the sort of the musical demands um, of great composers like Beethoven and Chopin and others pushed the technology in certain directions too. Yeah. Um, so- Make it an egg thing. Right, right, exactly. And you, you hear that, I mean, in Chopin's music all the time. Um, in Beethoven, of course, there's always this question of pushing against um, the limitations of the instrument. But in Chopin, you feel this sense of him exploiting everything that is possible. And of course, now with a modern instrument, the gradations of color and sound that are implicit in the music can now be kind of much more fully realized. Um, yeah. And I started by saying, why did you start the piano? And, and my own answer, if I might just say, is because whatever else we do in life, it, that is an infinite process that you never get to the bottom of this music, that it's constantly revealing itself and that you are understanding yourself through it in ways you have to simply go through, that, that sort of slow incremental process of discovery. And what I think, if I may just say, you, you touch on this so beautifully in the book, you know, that it's not about having to tackle something enormous, that in Chopin, some very small forms can just reveal themselves to go on endlessly, really. Um, it's, and, it's so beautiful. And the process of studying the piano, and I, I wonder if you've had this experience too, that it's, it's really, I mean, when you work, I think, and this may be true with any musical instrument, when you work at the piano, you, you face every issue in your own life. Right. Okay? every strength and every weakness, every habit that you wish you could have gotten rid of 40 years ago. And it's a process of almost, and with a good teacher, with an empathic teacher, yeah. um, you have somebody who's almost like a shrink, who's able to you know, say, you know what, I know you do that. I'm giving you permission here to not do that. And, yeah. and that is such a liberation. That's such a, you know, great teachers are, are, are just, so invaluable to us because they allow us to, to grow and to do that. So and you have to be honest when you play because you, you you have to be honest with yourself and your own weaknesses. And so it's it's a very, as you say, it's a very revealing process. Yeah. Um so let me ask a few questions that have come up. Okay. Um what one is what surprised you most in the course of your research on the book? Was there an unexpected moment of discovery? I think the real unexpected moment was um, was the moment when I walked into George Sand's home and and kind of understood this aspect of her personality. There was another moment too um, when we were in the forest and I learned the story of this sort of god that she made up, um, who was her kind of secret friend, and she would go and create altars to it in the forest. And, and a modern artist has created a, a, a piece of art in the forest. Um, I, I just, I found the tenderness um, in her humanity really just not, it, it, it ran contra, contrary to everything that I had read. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, what um, biographers and biographies were helpful to you? Well, there's Mount Everest of fantastic books about um, Chopin, and I'm not going to be able to name them all, but I'll tell you, I was really, really lucky that um, about halfway into my writing, Alan Walker published his biography of Chopin, which came out a couple years ago. It is the, you know, the, the masterpiece of the, mo the most the, um, important book in, in English now um, that um, and one of the things that was really interesting, I mean, of many, many things, and, and Walker's footnotes, by the way, are absolutely brilliant. And you can't not read the footnotes. You have to read every single word of his book. Um, but he had really interesting stuff about Chopin's father that hadn't really been understood before. So he paints this picture of, and, and of course, Chopin's father was French and his mother was Polish. So he had that dichotomy built into him, um, you know, in his own, in his own 
DNA. Um, so did you, I mean, did you sort of read everything and then absorb it and then decide I'm going to find my own way here? A little like Chopin? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I mean, I read every important book. I, I, I had to really push myself. One of the challenges in doing this book was pushing myself to ramp up my high school Spanish and French because a lot of the reading I, I did was in, was in those, and the, some of the interviews were also in, in French and Spanish. Um, there's an enormous amount of, of journalism, of musicology, um, you know, the, the, the major, the, the scholars that were most important to me were Helena Goldberg, uh, Jim Sampson, of course, who's written numerous books on Chopin, Jeffrey Kalberg, um, Walker, of course. Um, there are, I'm, I'm, leaving, I'm leaving some of them out, um, but um, there's also, you know, all the, all the letters that they wrote. Um, mm -hmm. And Chopin, Chopin's letters have been collected over in many different editions. And so those were really important. So yeah, I, 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 it took a long time to figure out how to do this book, what this book was. And, it, and, and when I finally figured out that I could make it work, it was because of place. It was because of understanding that there was a pathway and the pathway was gonna lead from New York to, um, you know, to Mallorca, to Paris, to Milan, to Ashburnham, to the Morgan Library in New York, where there's this amazing, how-to book that Chopin never completed, but in his in his own hand, um, where he talked about his very pioneering. I mean, this was one thing we didn't talk about, but there's only so much time. But his pioneering um, ideas about physical anatomy that mm. that went towards um, technique and achieving beauty and sound and a singing tone and, and all the things that that pianists prize. Yeah. So so that was the that was really the thread for me. And this mountain of research. Um, and I have a huge database and, um, and, and a lot of people were really generous. I discovered a lot of scholars and, and, and writers and, and would send me things, would send me files, would help me get resources. So it, I was able to um, get through because of the era we live in, because there's everything is digitized. I was able to go through a lot of material. Someone else asked what fact or piece of information about Chopin was the most surprising to you that you uncovered during your research? That's the kind of question that one should really be prepared to get. Um, <laughs> um, I, I guess really the most surprising thing, frankly, was the fact that he got rid of the word funeral and that, um, and, and there's a story and I tell the story and I offer my theory as to why this has to do with Hector Berlioz, who is another fascinating figure in this story. Um, that he, um, you know, one of the reasons that he, and, and, and of course, you know, no one, none of his publishers disregarded that. Pretty much after he died, the funeral march became iconic as Chopin's funeral march. It was played at his, fun his, own, as his own funeral in an orchestral version, which would have been very weird for him to hear. Um, but I think that, that fact that this thing that we know of as a funeral march was something that he decided in the end. Um, and, and one reason, by the way, just picking up on something that you said before about, about the, the, the works that he wrote and the, his sort of desire not to be um, didactic. Um, he really, it, it was a time when composers were putting titles on things and, you know, Mendelssohn and Schumann and all these guys, they put very evocative titles that would sort of conjure a lake or a river or whatever. Um, and he hated that. What Chopin said was, I indicate, it's up to the listener to complete the picture. And that's another really important um, piece of his whole um, sort of artistry. Yeah. understanding that. So, so getting rid of the word funeral, funeral, actually, once I got over the surprise when I read it, it just made perfect sense. Hmm. I would think yeah. he would do that. It would, be it would be less explicit and more implicit in the, it depends yeah. on how you want to interpret. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So another question is, what is it like to be writing when you, I'll get the question exactly, but it's, what, what's it like to be an author after being an editor in the publishing world? <laughs> You know, I, it was, um, it, it's been a really wonderful uh, experience, I have to say. And I did spend a lifetime in publishing and I had a lot of different jobs, but I was uh, reminded how much I love this process in a weird, in, a, in a, this business in a kind of a weird way. When my agent, Melanie Jackson, wonderful literary agent, sent out the proposal for my book and she sent it to a bunch of editors. And of course, some people rejected it, but the letters that they wrote me, the emails were so thoughtful and intelligent and supportive in rejection, you know? And I just thought, man, this is what I really love about this business, that you're just working with people who are, who are 
just really what they care about is the work they care about enabling the, the work. Um, so, you know, for me, the, the, the biggest surprise in this whole process was the audiobook was, was understanding like after a lifetime in publishing, I always, I think like a lot of people did, thought the audiobook just kind of happened, that it was sort of an afterthought. So much work goes into an audiobook. And, um, and, and for this one, we chose some music that's really cool. There's a thing on the website about it, if anybody's interested, why we chose the music that we did. Um, but there was this whole team of people and a guy who did research and produced like an eight page document on how to pronounce the names for the narrator. It's, it's really, I mean, audiobooks are wonderful. We all love them, but they really are a whole <laughs> different thing. It really blew my mind. Yeah. Um, another question, um, and maybe we have time for one more after this, if there is. Um, when you listen to the funeral march now, after spending so much time with Chopin, do you hear it differently? Does it strike you in different ways? Well, that's a really good question. You know, there's a there's a benchmark that I have. There's a performance that Vladimir Horowitz gave at Jimmy Carter's White House in 1978, and Horowitz does this thing in the so you know in that in that in the in the bass roll of the funeral march. The and it's this really dramatic moment that most pianists really bring out and they make it really brum. And Horowitz instead at the end of the funeral march, he does this thing that I've tried to do it, it's really hard. I mean, you really have to be, a, a, a you have to have those long fingers and, and that technique that he had. But he brings out instead this melody, this descending melody in um, those bum, bum, bum. And that's what you hear in his, in the ending of the funeral march. And there are very few pianists who either can or want to do that. Most of them want to go for that really virtuosic flourish. And so I always use that as a kind of a benchmark. Um, did, did, does a pianist do the Horowitz thing or do they go with the... So, you know, and, and of course, during the, the competition on period instruments, a lot of the young pianists played the piece. So I got to hear it a lot on the older instruments, which was really cool. Um, and did you come to love the old, the period instrument performances or the sound, I should say, more than uh, you do the modern performances? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I think, you know, it takes a lot of getting used to listening to those older pianos. Um, you really do have to, you do have to work on it and it's much more fun to hear it live. I really recommend people going if they're interested in pianos to the Frederick collection because they just do this amazing thing. It takes almost a whole day to go through it all. So um, by the way, uh, one other question was, could we repeat the name of that museum and exactly where it was. So it. The it is Collection. called the Frederick Collection of Historic Pianos in Ashburnham, Massachusetts, which looks like Ashburnham, but is apparently pronounced Ashburnham. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do it correctly. I, uh, I'm embarrassed to admit I've not been, so I'm gonna be one of those. You people. and I are gonna go together and you'll be really- We'll go, we'll go together, exactly. Yeah. All this post COVID hoping. Yes, uh, well, they, they are doing, you know, one by one tours now. So they, they, are, they, are, they are open now. Um, so. so if I see no other questions, I'm going to ask the last one, which is, so how's it going, you playing the, um, the third move, the funeral march? You, you have it under your fingers now? Are you, have you mastered it? I can, yeah, but I, but I, I now I want to, after you and I were talking the other day, I want to, I want to, I want to try the finale. I want to, um, you know, musicologists argue about whether that should be played slow or fast. And, um, I think maybe if I start playing it really slowly, I'll be able to, I'll be able to eventually get there. But you hear stuff when you play it really slowly, you hear these melodies that he put in there that are really, that's why I like hearing it slowly. That's another thing that just listening to the sonata now, um, when it gets to the last movement, it's a real question that a pianist has to address is are they gonna race through it like the wind going over the graves or are they gonna let you hear those melodies, you know, as they, and, um, it's always be good to begin any new piece playing slowly. <laughs> so it's the only way I can do it myself. Yeah, it's, all it. practice. it's all practice. Yeah. Um, and it's such a wonderful book and it's such a joy to read. And it, it's, I, I just think um, it'll be a revelation to even to people who know a lot about Chopin and love his music. So thanks for talking about it. Thank you. This book literally would not exist without you, Michael, because <laughs> I, I that's, that's that. not true, but I'm happy it uh, oh, yeah. played for it. Um, and thank you both. I forgot to hold up the book. Of course, I swore I was going to at the beginning. So I want to, <laughs> before we all sign off, I want everybody to see this beautiful cover. 
Also, you should note the uh, in pages here, which are quite lovely. Yeah. Um, again, you can purchase Anique's book in the uh, by, on the link on the chat column. You can find her website there. Uh, Michael and Anique, thank you again for uh, doing this with us. We're so um, delighted to have you. So honored. What a great conversation. Uh, we love the book and uh, we're so happy that it's out in the world now. So congratulations. Thank you both again. And uh, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, be well, be well read. Thank you so much. Support your local independent bookseller. Thank, thank you. you. That okay. too. <laughs> <laughs>